My name is Tommy Toon, and I'm a big fan of entertainment. I guess it's existed as long as people have gathered together to take time out from their everyday lives. All it requires is an audience and, well, maybe some talent. Today, there's entertainment on every side to suit every taste. With so many stars, one can hardly keep track. Imagine then a time when for more than five years, one small girl could grip the attention of an entire movie-going world, could be adored by the high and the mighty and by millions of ordinary folk. Because of her, tens of thousands of kids, including yours truly, were sent to tap classes. It happened in Hollywood. And it happened not so long ago. We thought that love was over, that we were really through. It was a matter of being the right person for a very special time. And yet, it was much more. Before and since, there was never anyone else quite like her. She was the child star loved by an entire world. Her name was Shirley Temple. For four years in a row, from 1935 to 1938, Shirley Temple was the number one box office star in Hollywood. She was even more popular than Clark Gable, Robert Taylor, and Gary Cooper. Because of her films, her studio, Fox, was saved from bankruptcy. She had this natural charm and this great charisma that came out uh, on the screen. Lost a week, a gun that only came at all. Nice, old, a geezer with a lost cross. See, my, a Mrs. Bates is top barrel. And the very gentle one you are. She was a product of the Great Depression. President Franklin Delano Roosevelt recognized her appeal when he said that it was a splendid thing that for just 15 cents, Americans could go to a movie and look at the smiling face of a little girl and forget their troubles. Shirley Jane Temple was born April 23, 1928. Gertrude Temple, who already had two sons, yearned for a daughter, and she set about making her baby special. Her father, George Temple, worked in a Santa Monica bank, and he indulged his wife's every dream for Shirley. Shirley's early training included music and art appreciation and watching her mother dance to a tambourine to instill a sense of rhythm in her. Shirley was barely three when Gertrude decided she was ready for the next step. The Meglin Dance Studio was known to every ambitious parent as an entryway to show business. I kind of snuck in there a few years later. Ethel Meglin created this school for singing and dancing and I guess learning the beginnings of acting. And Shirley was a Meglin Kitty, the most famous Meglin Kitty. When directors from a small movie studio visited Meglin in search of ten boys and two girls for a series of one reel comedies, Shirley was selected. Why doesn't my sweetheart come and see me from this vile place? I cannot go on. I'm so tired of it all. Please let me go. I'll hold you here until you decide to marry me. No, no. A thousand times no, you beggar's beggar. The shorts were called baby burlesques, which is just what they were. Children, little more than toddlers, in diapers and exaggerated safety pins, enacted scenes drawn from adult melodrama. I cannot talk here. He is watching. Come on with me. Even then, Shirley Temple stood out. Love, love. 
I played the lead in a series of high school comedies for educational pictures called The Frolics of Youth. The first day of production when I showed up on the set, there was this cute little four-year-old girl named Shirley Temple, who I learned was going to play my sister. The Frolics of Youth were two real comedies, and as I recall, we made them in, in five days, whereas the baby burlesques were one reel, and they probably only took maybe three days. Oh, Mary Lou. Good morning to you. Happy birthday to you. Gee, so it is. <laughs> Ray! Ray! Happy birthday, son. <laughs> really she didn't know how to read yet. Funny. So every night after work, I guess while her mother was giving her a bath, she would read her the scenes that were going to be shot the following day. So as a result, when Shirley showed up on the set the next morning, she knew everybody's lines. Now, if any one of us made a mistake, in all sweetness, nothing precocious, she would say, oh no, you're supposed to say, and then she'd tell us what we were supposed to say. And you know, she was never wrong. What do you got there? Phyllis, do you know anything about dogs? Well, it's somebody Throw it away, Sonny. Oh, shut up. How did you ever happen to bring home a thing like that? Are you going to let Dad and Mother see her? We'd better give her a bath first. Oh, goody, goody, goody. We're going to give the dog a bath. Stop that, Mary Lou. Stop it. Shirley really enjoyed uh, being a little actress. Mary Lou, stop that. I never did see her pamper and, and cry on the set like a lot of other little kids did. <laughs> <laughs> the first time I can ever remember her, I remember her with her mother, and uh, I was carrying Shirley's suitcase and my dad was carrying Mrs. Temple's suitcase, and we were going to our separate little cabins there on location for the making of the movie uh, To the Last Man, which was starring Randolph Scott. And we played a brother and a sister in, in the movie. Got to give me a kiss, boys. <laughs> we played together all the time after that on, on, the, on location there. We just ran all over the, the place. They had all these animals and horses and little puppies. That was a big deal in the picture. They had these cute little puppies. And she was actually just like uh, kind of a little sister to me at the time. During 1933, Shirley had bit parts in seven feature films. One of these was Now I'll Tell, starring Spencer Tracy. Also in the cast was Alice Faye. Because I was in awe of Spencer Tracy. I, I wasn't hardly thinking about anybody else. I mean, Spencer Tracy was just uh, killing me. Imagine me in a picture with Spencer Tracy. And we hadn't heard too much about Shirley Temple, and she sort of came out of the blue. In the script, it read, this is the kind of child that every mother would dream of having. She's a beautiful little girl with blonde curls and dimples. And I was sitting with my mom in the office, and about that time, the door opened, and without a doubt, through that door walked the most adorable, the most beautiful, the most precious little girl I'd ever seen in my whole life. And I said, well, even though my heart sank to my toes, I said, well, Lord, I guess it's just not my turn yet, because I know she's it. She's just what that script calls for, because she is really precious. This film, Stand Up and Cheer, introduced five-year-old Shirley Temple to the world. Her part was small, but show business would never be the same again. Audiences and reviewers alike were bowled over by this unheralded little girl, who could dance and act up a storm with such disarming ease. Shirley could make people believe if only for 90 minutes, that uh, there were no problems in the world. This little kid put more heart back into people and got the people thinking in a positive way and gave this country a lift when we needed it. The depression cut across American society, but Shirley Temple 
made people feel that eventually everything would be all right. You forgot, you know, that there were men selling apples on the street coming to the back door and asking for food and work or work and food or, or anything. And being at a Shirley Temple film was complete getaway. We were searching for a sense of love and caring and childlike belief in the fact that she could have fun and sing and dance and give love and affection uh, to whoever what was was something that reminded us that we had that in us too look at the funny side and have your fun say by your honey side and laugh you son of a gun it was 1934 fox film corporation signed the five-year-old to a year's contract at 150 dollars a week then quickly lent her out to paramount pictures at a sizable profit the picture was Little Miss Marker. It was to star Adolf Manjou, who did not like to work with children. I paid the Lord my soul to take. And make me a good little girl. You don't want to be a little girl? No, no, dear. Make you a good little girl. Make me a good little girl. Is that all? That's the works. But when do I ask for what I want? You better do it right now while your prayer is still hot. Please, God. Buy your story a new suit of clothes. By the end of filming, Manju had become another Shirley Temple devotee. He even suggested to Paramount that instead of payment for his role, he take a percentage of the film's profit. Paramount refused the offer. Say no thank you. What for? Well, you used to say thank you and no thank you. I used to be a sissy. Now, where did you get that? Ain't telling. And I don't want no mush. Manju guessed right. Little Miss Marker was an instant hit. In three weeks, it took in half its original cost at just one New York City theater. Paramount offered Fox $50,000 for Shirley's contract. The offer was refused. When she made Little Miss Marker at Paramount, uh, my husband was a writer for the Marx Brothers, and he came home one evening and said, you know, Harpo offered to buy Shirley Temple today. Well, she's such a discovery. She's such a darling child. He had already adopted four. And that was my first uh, knowledge of, of Shirley and, and what a genius she was. Overnight, it seemed she had become America's little girl. Almost everyone wanted to adopt Shirley. Scripts were tailored to bring this out. Now, uh, it's my duty to decide who is going to adopt you. You agree to surrender the child. I agree to adopt her. I'm taking legal steps to adopt, Shirley. Why don't you get nice and adopt her? Because I'm not a young married couple. What's that? We're getting married. We want to adopt her. At Fox, Shirley was rushed into a movie named after the song she had sung in Stand Up and Cheer. The picture was Baby Take a Bow. Shirley was now an acknowledged star, and to prove it, she had her own stand-in. They needed a dancing class and decided to take us and teach Shirley a dance that we already knew. And while we were at the studio the following day, they uh, came over and they said, everybody stand up, and they looked at me and they said, you're fine, and they took me over and stood me back to back with Shirley. We were exactly the same size, and they hired me as her stand-in. Shirley and I were best friends. We had a wonderful time together. We invented all kinds of games, and of course, when the sets weren't being used, you know, we'd go and play house in these wonderful places. She had a wonderful rapport with all of the, the uh, actors that she worked with, and they all adored her. I'm sorry, Daddy. What do you mean? Tony told me. Told you what, Penny? That she stole it. Please, Daddy, forgive me. Please. Why, of course. Of course, Tony. Lean down.
Shirley's acting ability was more being Shirley um, in a pretend situation than it was actually acting. You always felt that she was that person doing that thing, saying that line. Daddy, something's caught. I've been standing on my head almost. Let me do it. Thank you. I am very glad to meet you. I guess I should have said that at the station. And so should I. I'm sorry. The studios, they had a gold mine in her, and they didn't want her to, to get uh, affected. That's probably the best word I could use is they wanted to keep her isolated. Uh, she couldn't she couldn't go out. She could she had a bowling alley I know that they built for her in her home and a little soda fountain there. Shirley was around adults uh mainly. I don't think that she had a great many children to play with. There were certainly never any children uh that we played with on the set. I remember when we did a, a film with Jane Withers that um we were not allowed to play with Jane. She had some kind of magic something that other children simply didn't have. She was so different than other child actors who were sort of, um, they all had a, a, a sort of professional air about them. Shirley n never had that, that air about her, that uh, kind of stilted uh, uh, acting, actory acting kind of thing. She was very, very natural. She was Shirley. The little girl was like apple pie and just a normal, normal little girl and that interested me. I wanted to see the mother and when I met her mother I realized I knew why because she was a great lady and she was always with her and it was just a, a great combination. Mrs. Temple just adored Shirley. You could see the love there. Shirley loved what she was doing. She loved to dance. She, 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 she loved everything, and, and you could see it. With the release of Bright Eyes, Shirley Temple had ushered in the era of the child star. In studio after studio, the search was on. Mickey Rooney, Jackie Cooper, Deanna Durbin, bright, wonderful children who were signed up and rushed into picture after picture. But in the early 30s, none would be more luminous than Shirley Temple. With the release of Bright Eyes, over 4,000 letters a week began arriving at Fox, all addressed to Shirley Temple. The studio had dropped a year from Shirley's age, hoping to magically prolong her childhood and their bonanza. She appeared in eight films in just one year, 1934, but her salary remained $150 a week. Product endorsements with Shirley's name and picture brought the studio large sums every year, but Shirley received no part of it. Finally, at her mother Gertrude's insistence, Shirley's salary was raised to $1,000 a week. For her role as tutor and advisor, Gertrude received $250. Shirley's parents would now control her product endorsements. A lot of people thought that Gertrude Temple was tough, and Gertrude Temple was tough. I adored Gertrude Temple. Uh, she was warm and generous to us and to my family. Uh, and also I sensed in her somebody that wasn't going to be pushed around. And I envied that. I wished that my parents had been more that way. She was the, the ultimate stage mother. She was uh, uh, there for Shirley at every turn. She directed her. She really created Shirley Temple the star. Mrs. Temple would sit on a stool in, in back of the camera, and she loved to, to see the different things that, that Shirley did. And she would always say, sparkle, Shirley, and Shirley sparkled all the time. In 1935, Shirley received a special award from the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences for what was called her monumental achievement. Thank you very much, Mr. Cobb. 
Mommy, can I go home now? <laughs> that same year, Fox merged with Century Studio, and 20th Century Fox came into being. Daryl F. Zanuck became the new studio head. An essential job was to maintain the meteoric rise of one of the new company's major assets, Shirley Temple. I started working for Daryl Zanuck uh, even before I was under contract to 20th Century Fox. He was a powerhouse at the studio. He got everything that he wanted. Everything had to be his way. Well, Mrs. Temple was a tall lady, as I remember. At least she seemed that way to me as a child. And Zanuck was very short. I, I knew that. And, uh, but irrespective of their relative sizes, I can tell you, knowing Mrs. Temple, she stood up to Daryl Zanuck. Daryl Zanuck did not push her around. And I think he pushed about everybody else around. He didn't push her around. Shirley was always a star at 20th Century Fox. She didn't have to adjust to going to a public school and then coming back and doing a movie like I did. I always got my schooling on the set and Shirley got her schooling in uh, her bungalow. Uh, we each had our own private tutor. Being a child, uh, and probably being the biggest movie star in the world, she had it in spades. I mean, she had her own special house on the lot with this little picket fence and this beautiful little place. She had her special dressing room. She always had her special teacher. She always had special makeup artists. She always had special wardrobe artists. She always went in a special car to the set. She always had a special place to live. I remember driving down Sunset Boulevard when I was a kid, and you could see her house up on the right, and there was a little house out in the back, which was her like her playhouse, which was a special house for Shirley to have. I mean, everything in, in Shirley's life was special to the nth degree. A survey of young girls in 1935 found that Shirley Temple was the person they most wished to be like. Next on the list was Amelia Earhart, followed by Eleanor Roosevelt. Shirley Temple's birthday, and Will Rogers makes a speech. We gathered here today to unveil a, a picture of you here. Now, I'm not going to make a speech, because I'm so long-winded, I make <laughs> speeches for everywhere for no reason whatever, and you are the biggest entertainer in the world today and you have arrived at that position by not making speeches. So a painting of Shirley is unveiled in the Fox Studio dining room in Hollywood. Will Rogers was among Shirley's special friends. When his plane crashed in Alaska in 1935, the entire country mourned. 20th Century Fox had another reason to be unhappy. Rogers had been its biggest money-making star. Now there was only Shirley at the top. To protect its investment, the studio assigned a detective to guard her round the clock. Shirley's films continued to work their magic at the box office as Shirley worked hers on the screen. Everybody that came to California, that came to Hollywood and visited the studios, no matter who they were, they all wanted to meet Shirley Temple. The Temples were determined to give Shirley a private life but the studio was just as determined to feed the public's hunger for every bit of news about Shirley. How Gertrude Temple maintained her famous daughter's curls, where Shirley went on vacation, and what she did there. Waikiki Beach, a new lifeguard, ready in case any 300-pounder should get into trouble in the surf. Inducted into the beach patrol, sweater decorated with the beach emblem. She'll still do a little acting on the side, but right now the little colonel wants to be a little captain. She was a very important part of that studio. Number one, she made a lot of money for that studio. They were very conscious of the kind of publicity that had to go out about her. They protected her in every way. A big rally for a little girl. They did everything for her, and she was publicized. They had dolls, they had dresses, they had jewelry, everything, the Shirley Temple. I remember once they bought Shirley a little automobile, a miniature real automobile, and everybody was very excited about going over and seeing it. People just fell for all over the place. Every year, the studio gave her a birthday party, 
and she received gifts from all over the world. All of Hollywood's children were invited by the publicity department. I want to thank you very much. I think it's very nice to have a big party like this. I remember I brought a, a, a handkerchief, and I, I was very self-conscious about that. And uh, my mother said, she doesn't need a gift that she will give her. It would just embarrass her. It wouldn't be appropriate. But so many of the other children that we knew were not terribly successful and were having a difficult time brought these lavish, lavish gifts. And all of them were sent unopened to an orphanage. So Shirley really never even knew what she got. You please tell all my friends that I'm sure that they can't come to my birthday party. But will you thank them for the lovely cake? Think about how difficult it would be to be a child and sensitive to other people when you're being put on a throne all the time. I mean, people tend to be that way with celebrities anyway. With Shirley Temple, it was almost nauseating. Shirley Temple was at the top in box office popularity. At nine years of age, she was still ahead of Clark Gable, Robert Taylor, and Bean Crosby. In spite of some pessimistic forecasts, Shirley's magic remained. Shirley Temple was a tremendous star, as big a star as you'd want. She was a delightful little girl, an extraordinary little girl. I worked with her in Wee Willie Winkie and the Little Princess. Wee Willie Winkie actually was a part of a boy, but they made it into a girl for Shirley. She would do anything that she was told. In Wee Willie Winkie, she had to run across a road when they were having sort of a stampede of horses and Hindus rode riding around and she ran right through there, didn't hesitate at all. She had a lot of guts, that little girl. The same year Wee Willie Winkie was released, Shirley appeared in a childhood classic, Heidi. It reunited her with an old friend. They had a call for a kid, a boy my age, about 12, 13 years old, and there was about eight of us lined up on the set there. And uh, they'd go down the line asking you, you know, your name. So they just wanted to hear your voice, really, to see if you had any stage presence. The director finally turned to Shirley, and he says, which one of these boys would you like to play Peter the Goat Boy? And she says, I like Delmar. <laughs> Before, we used to play on the sets and play with the puppies and everything. But when we were making Heidi, it was an altogether different thing. She stayed in her trailer, she'd practice her lines, she'd come out of the trailer, go down and do the scene where her stand-in would be standing in for her. We would do our lines or whatever we were going to do, and then she would, with a bodyguard, they would take her back up to her trailer, and she'd go inside there. They, for one thing, they didn't want her to get sunburned, and the other thing was they were very much afraid of kidnapping in those days or what could happen to her. In Heidi, I played the cripple girl. I remember that uh, we were supposed to be in Switzerland. We were really in Lake Arrowhead. And Shirley wanted to play miniature golf. We did play, but there was about four or five bodyguards with us. And it really bothered me. It didn't bother Shirley at all. She didn't really think that uh, her life was unique in any respect. She thought that all children worked, uh, that they all went to the studio. And she said that the only thing that she really didn't like about it very much was uh, having to get all dressed up in a, in a, uh, a Santa Claus costume and uh, uh, winter clothes um, in August uh, when they, they shot the Christmas calendars. In 1938, MGM's Louis B. Mayer thought he had the perfect project for Shirley Temple. Daryl F. Zanuck refused to loan her out. And so the role went to a little-known MGM contract player named Judy Garland. The picture was The Wizard of Oz. But Zanuck's competitive spirit had been roused, and he made his own plans for Shirley. Thank you. 
Princess was Shirley's highest budgeted film to date, and it was her first all-color picture. In The Little Princess, the, the one thing I do remember about Shirley is that we, we had a scene where she was to dump ashes all over me. They had rehearsed us and rehearsed us and rehearsed us. They also had an extra dress for me and an extra dress for Shirley. They wanted to do it in one take. You don't? Why, you little liar. You haven't even had breakfast. Pardon me, but I really have. And if you'll excuse me for saying so, it isn't polite to call people liars. How dare you talk back to me? I doing that? My goodness! <laughs> When they said cut, everybody was screaming, and Shirley just stood there, and she looked around, and she ran over to the director, and she said, can we do that again? When we start the blessed donkey shop, he won't move, so I quickly up. Pals start a wagon, and when Johnny drops, I won't tell you what my the go. A water and cheese. Temple urged Zanuck to find stories for Shirley that showed her as a real girl with the problems of a real girl. Shirley was growing up, but her roles weren't changing. When at last the Bluebird gave Shirley the chance to play a girl who wasn't always perfect, audiences were not happy with the change. In 1939, when she was 11 years old, Shirley presented Walt Disney with one small Oscar for each dwarf in Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Shirley's popularity was still high. By 1940, the studio had starred her in 19 films in six years. Her pictures had been among its highest grocers. Yet soon, Shirley's contract at 20th Century Fox would be coming to an end. Young People, her last film at 20th Century Fox. Yes, I was there. And I remember her being very sweet on the set, a little bit remote because she went to school by herself. The rest of the kids went to school uh, in a school room, and then Shirley had her dressing room where her teacher worked with her. Uh, but she was, very, she was very sweet with all the kids on the set. And I remember I felt a certain respect, and I think the other kids did too, because she was very gentle and very professional. And so it, was, it would be very hard not to like her. Even though Shirley was fifth in the box office ratings, her contract with 20th Century Fox was not renewed. But she was becoming more like other girls her age. The reason? Shortly before she left Fox, a happy Shirley had enrolled in Westlake, a private girls' school in Beverly Hills. It was her first school outside the studio. She had a very normal life from then on. And she went to uh, dances and parties. Uh, I had a party at my house one time, and she came to the, to the party, albeit with uh, bodyguards outside, but uh, she, she came to my house. Shirley was now free to work at any studio. In 1942, she appeared in Miss Annie Rooney. She was 14 years old. Cast as Shirley's boyfriend, Dickie Moore was called upon to give Shirley her first screen kiss. It was a, a traumatic experience for me. I, my, my suit was soaked with perspiration. And there was a wall of news photographers lining the set. They wanted to record my peck on her cheek, which was a very timid, self-conscious peck. And that, those photos appeared on the front page of virtually every newspaper in the country. 
It was really the symbolic loss of the world's most famous and beloved child. The following year, Shirley was signed by David O. Selznick to be one of a group of players contracted to him. It included some of the top stars of Hollywood. The first film Shirley appeared in for Selznick was Since You Went Away. Even though Selznick saw Shirley as the ideal American teenager, he feared audiences were not ready to accept their Shirley in any role that showed her in too sexy a light. But Shirley refused to tone down her youthful looks or clothes. Motion picture critics apparently approved. They voted her as giving the best juvenile performance of the year. America had declared war, and Shirley visited hospitals, army bases, and war plants. She appeared on radio comedy shows and her own radio series, Junior Miss. More and more she was taking charge of her own life. Shirley had worked well with a goodly number of handsome leading men. Gary Cooper, James Dunn, Joel McRae. It was no surprise when Shirley started dating a handsome Marine sergeant. What was a surprise was when 17-year-old Shirley Temple, the actress no one believed would ever grow up, decided to marry the sergeant. His name was John Agar. Their wedding drew thousands of fans and meant instant news and disbelief around the world. It was her life she had a right to. She'd been uh, entertaining people, what, how many years? 10, 15 years. That little girl was in curlers and uh, memorizing lines and working to playbacks and making everybody happy and doing everything she was told to do. It was time she broke out and married, whether it went or whether it went wrong or it was right. It was her, she had a right to do that. Hello, Mr. Richard. The Bachelor and the Bobby Soxer gave Shirley the chance to play a love-smitten teenager. Vicky, hello. She was 18 and married, but producers were not yet ready to play Shirley in a totally adult role. Shirley was a very healthy creature. She was sexy and she was funny and she was vulnerable and she was full of fun. Very interesting girl. And I think that that people tried to keep her in the mold of the of the goody two shoes, even as she was growing up and trying to become a woman. Well, if you're leaving home you might take something more practical than a doll. I hate you. Susan, you can't mean that. I do. My own sister stealing the man I love. Susan, you're not being fair. The other woman. It's not like that at all. Why don't you send me to prison and get me out of the way? Susan, I'm old enough to fight for my own happiness. Anyway, I saw him first. The same year, 1947, Shirley made a picture, That Hagen Girl, co-starring a man she would one day work with in other fields, Ronald Reagan. The film gave Shirley a chance to act and not just be cute. Her fans were disappointed with the results. Where's your towel? You'll be as fresh as a daisy. Thanks, Ma. But audiences still flock to see a picture with Shirley Temple, and now her new husband, John Agar. Oh, I'm sorry, ma'am. I, I thought it was Ma. I beg your pardon! Ford Apache, directed by John Ford, was part of his John Wayne Cavalry trilogy. But for Shirley Temple fans, it was a romance with a happy ending. Colonel Thursday, sir, what I've been trying to tell you, sir, is that I love your daughter. And I ask her now in your presence to be my wife. Yes, Michael. I see. Philadelphia, I ask you to reconsider. No, Father. I tell you, this is not a proper or suitable marriage for you. I can't believe that. Few knew that for Shirley and John Agar, their romance had taken a different turn. She was lovely, but she lost something. 
as a child, uh, she had that little tiny tyke and the beautiful little body and her curls and her expressions. And as she grew up, she grew up to be a beautiful, beautiful young lady, but she lost something, and I don't know what that was. I heard Spielberg say something once that he enjoyed directing children so much more than adults because they were so much freer than adults. And that's really the basic thing. A child, by I had no acting technique. I don't think Shirley had any acting technique. I don't think most of us had any real technique. What we had was a pure heart, and the heart spoke, and, and people responded. They also remembered. In a national poll in 1947, Shirley Temple tied with June Allison for the title America's Girlfriend. Elizabeth Taylor was runner-up. The birth of Shirley's daughter the following year prompted Selznick to offer the baby a picture contract sight unseen. Shirley was not interested. In October 1949, after just three years of marriage, 21-year-old Shirley Temple announced she was divorcing John Agar. Selznick's publicity staff pleaded for a delay. She had just been voted Mother of the Year. Shirley replied that at least they had not selected her Wife of the Year. It was a time of endings. In April of that year, Selznick had put his whole company up for sale. Another ending. A Kiss for Coralus proved to be Shirley Temple's last feature film. When the picture was completed, Shirley went on vacation to Hawaii with her daughter and her parents. There she met Charles Black, a young businessman from San Francisco who seemed unique. He had never seen a film starring America's Little Darling. Within months, Shirley became Mrs. Charles Black. Her commitment to other goals began to take hold, yet she still remained in the public eye. And no one has matured more gracefully or beautifully with Hollywood than Shirley Temple. Well, Ronnie, there's only one bad thing about growing up in Hollywood. As you grow older, why, everybody else grows older too, and, well, all the wonderful people here in Hollywood that have contributed so much to our industry, when they grow too old to work, why, they, they can live out here at this home, and they're guests here, and it's really wonderful. <laughs> and I'm proud that I grew up in Hollywood. Who wouldn't be? From time to time, she appeared on television and had her own series. But eventually, she turned away from her career as an actress. I really feel that Shirley Temple, by the time she was a grown woman, had had it. Not that she was... Uh, turning her back on the business, I think she had fulfilled herself. That's my best instinct. I, I think Shirley went on to have another life. My picture was in a book about Shirley, and a reporter from the school newspaper came over and said, uh, there's a, a picture of a girl in here with the same name as you, and this person was Shirley Temple stand-in. And I looked at the picture and I said, no, that must be some other Marilyn Grant. I said, it's not me. I wasn't Shirley Temple's stand-in. I didn't want to be known as Shirley Temple's stand-in. I wanted to be Marilyn Grant's me. And uh, I think Shirley wanted a life of her own, too. I guess if you have a fantasy, you'd want to grow up and be Shirley Temple. On the other hand, you have to pay the price for it. And I think if Mrs. Temple hadn't been as formidable as she was, I think that Shirley would have turned out not the way she turned out. I've known a lot of child actors who grew up in a lot less advantageous ways who are now dead because they could not survive. For five years, from 1934 to 1939, Shirley Temple had been America's little darling. Her smile had given smiles to audiences everywhere, and her tears had reached into every heart. Her love had transformed the grouchiest of skin flints into the most amiable souls. No person was unredeemable or immune to Shirley's special charm. That charm also helped promote a new career. When she entered the political arena, her fame became an asset, 
and gave her the chance to do what she had always done well, relate to people. Shirley Temple doesn't hurt Shirley Temple Black. Shirley Temple helps Shirley Temple Black because Shirley Temple is remembered with love, with affection. Um, I'm thought of as a friend, which I am. Shirley Temple Black's achievements have been many. A long-standing and happy marriage, mother of three children, and now a grandmother, U.S. Chief of Protocol, Special Envoy to the United Nations, Ambassador to Ghana, Ambassador to Czechoslovakia. These are formidable entries on any resume, and she is much prouder of them than she was uh, of, of, of uh, being a child star. She'd much rather talk about these things. As she says, my life is now. I refuse to live in the past. And she does refuse to live in the past. But what a past that was, a past that will never be forgotten. Gertrude's message has endured. Throughout her life, Shirley Temple has sparkled. Good night, my love. Your mommy is kneeling beside you. There's no one that can come up to the greatness and the popularity of this little girl. She's in a class by herself and always will be. She was just a, a bright, um, glittering little star that gave everybody a lot of hope. I've lived a good many years and I've worked with a lot of people, but I've never, ever worked with anybody like her. Shirley's gift to show business to the United States and to the movie-going public was a revelation of the creativity and the sense of joy and fun of childhood that is in each of us. I don't think any child ever did that better than Shirley Temple. Sleep tight, my love. Good night, my love.